no, I was married at 20 in, in Florida, thank you very much, and on purpose, quite, quite on purpose. But I met my wife when I was 15 in, in pre-calculus class. And so I literally haven't been single since I was 14, which um, was a bit ago. Um, <clears throat> hey, that was not the joke. <laughs> I will let you know. All right. Um, and so if you're single or you're dating, you might have a hard time listening to me. And, and I think this is God's irony. I think God is hilarious, by the way, because it would have been very easy for a married guy like me to go to a church and, and plant a church in the burbs somewhere where, where married people live and dwell with their 2.3 children, minivans, and white picket fences. But that's like six of y'all. I mean, there's not, I mean, of, of, the, of the many of you that are here, that, that's not very many. And so it, it's very funny to me that the Lord would send me with my passel of children and my, and my wife to... Um, to a town where not too, many, too much of that is going on and to pastor a church filled with people not very much like me in this way. And that's a, that's a danger for you because you could hear me talk and think, you don't know what I'm going through. Why would I ever listen to you? You don't know what singleness is like. You don't know what it's like to date. And, and, and you're kind of right. However, I'm not talking to you from Pastor Adam's five easy steps to having a better life. My job is to bring out God's wisdom and word to you. And if you never listen to anyone who isn't exactly like you, then you will only listen to yourself. And the scriptures say that if you only listen to yourself, you're a fool. And probably by the time we get to the end of your life, we will all agree. If you will only listen to truth from sources that look like you, you won't hear very much. So I'm pleading with you this morning as a guy whom God has asked to be like a spiritual father, not the only one, but one in this house. Listen. The book of Proverbs opens, actually, with, with the same kind, of, same kind of story. You've got a father speaking to his son, his coming of age, and he's saying, listen, son, who you marry matters. And he couches living a wise life and living a foolish life in this grand metaphor of marrying the woman of wisdom and avoiding the woman of folly. So maybe you're a woman and you're hearing that and you're like, well, that sounds kind of sexist. How will I connect with this book? Listen, don't, don't hear it like that. Stories have characters, okay? Um, and so it would be wrong of you to hear this book and, and reject its wisdom because of the, the, the gender of the nouns. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that because in Christ now, we can absolutely see the wisdom of this book and would be very free just to flop it around and say, okay, well then hear it as a really wise mother, woman of God, talking to her daughters, saying, okay, hon, this is what you need. You need, I'm pleading with you, unite your life to wisdom, not to folly. So what's it say? <laughs> You're like, enough of the opening remarks. Get on with it. All right. Well, just remember, you asked for it. If God um, is going to make give us wisdom in terms of romance and romantic relationships, what, what I want to do is, is talk to you about the three stages of those relationships. Singleness. What does it look like to be single? What, what dating can look like? What does it look like to do that wisely? And then what, what the book of Proverbs has to say to us in terms of uh, the relationship of, of marriage. And, and I'm doing this intentionally because it, it is my observation, and not only mine, that the church has held out marriage as like the best state of existence. And so if you're not married, well then just come right here to our singles ministry. And um, <clears throat> we don't have a singles ministry. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have Sunday morning. Um, and <laughs> and uh, it's literally like pastoring a middle school dance sometimes. We're in a gym. Uh, and... <laughs> It's like all the ladies over here and all the dudes over here and then the people that are dancing are the people that shouldn't be. Um, you know, that weird kid with the tuxedo t-shirt. And if you wore that this morning, awesome. Um, <laughs> no hate, all respect. Um, but we just, need, we just need some wisdom for each stage of, these, um, st stage of life and, and we'll explain why. But we're going to take dating first. We're going to take dating first. What does it look like to pursue a dating relationship well? And the way we're going to do this is just by collecting everything the Proverbs says about this particular topic. So let me make an observation first. Dating, number one, dating toward marriage is, is a good thing. Or dating for fun is stupid. Um, whichever way you'd like to hear that, um, both are true. Dating toward marriage is good. Hey, did you know that getting married is like a good thing? Here, let me tell you, it is a good thing. 
And, and, and so dating, though, as a hobby, really dumb. Really, really dumb. Listen, model building, right? Scrapbooking, playing tennis, weightlifting, running. Running is a terrible hobby, but running. Um, <laughs> those are hobbies. Dating, stupid hobby. Really stupid hobby. First of all, extremely expensive, so you didn't think this through. B, emotionally quite costly. And C, revealing of deep insecurity. Some of you, you date like it's your job because you are afraid of the person waiting for you in the mirror and to be alone with him or her terrifies you. Jesus can help with that, and we'll talk about that a little later. But dating toward a goal is the biblical ideal. Dating toward a goal is a biblical ideal, and, and, and which means the two extremes of dating are probably not the best. Now, dating, when, when you date someone in the church, sometimes I've seen this happen, like when Christians begin dating, we can make it weird, y'all, weird. We call it things that no one's called it in 500 years, and, and it's, you know, it's, well, we went on a date, so we're picking out China now. Like, no, no, listen, hey, just have coffee, and then decide if you want to do that again. And if you don't, it's cool. We don't need a divorce. We don't need a priest. We don't need a judge. It's all right. It's all right. You can part ways as friends. It's fine. But we put this weird, weird, weird pressure on it. And we do that because we think it's the greatest state of existence. The Bible doesn't, by the way. But we overpressurize it. But then we don't want to do what the rest of the world does, which is just to underpressurize it and think that it's no big deal and, and whomever your heart and your soul mingle with romantically, that's just not a big deal. Yes, it's a totally big deal. It's a big deal. So date toward a goal. Date toward the goal of, you know, the hunting and finding of a spouse. Don't use weapons, but you see the imagery. Um, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. We've been kind of taught that like marriage is that thing that you should do like in your mid to late 40s or maybe 50s or with good modern medicine, early 60s, after you've already gotten all of your good years out. Like just go do what you really want to do in life. Go do what you, you know, just have all your fun by yourself because once you're married, it is over. Okay? And then once you have kids, oh my gosh, it's over, over. And that's just not ever in the scriptures. Now, you might say, well, but that was a different time. People didn't live as long, you know, modern technology. And that's adorable. But people were selfish then, too. And what we want to do is perpetuate the time when we can live for self. And that's not good. God didn't design it to be that way. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Re rejoice in the wife of your youth. Your youth. That's, a, that, that's okay. That's a good thing. It's not the only way. It's, you're not bad if you didn't do that. It's, it, I'm just saying what the Proverbs say, that it's okay to do that in your youth. That, that's all right. I got married when I was 20 on purpose. And no, she was not pregnant. Okay, on purpose, all right? Just, I get that question a lot, so let me just go ahead and make it. No, no, I got married because I loved her. My family, on the other hand, didn't really value that. So when, as a 19-year-old, I came home with a ring, my father was like, what in the, and then there were some words that I can't say, and then, what are you doing? And I'm so glad I did. That was God's plan, God's destiny, God's path for me. It's a good thing. Dating toward a goal is a good thing. Just think about that. Second thing, date the right person. Let's just all talk about this one for a minute, everybody. <laughs> date the right person, or... Tender is treble, all right? <laughs> listen, listen. Okay, but no, seriously, listen. If you have Tinder on your phone, you need to delete that. I'm not joking. The commoditization of the human body dehumanizes the human being. The commoditization of the human body de dehumanizes the human being. And if you think that you can judge someone on hot or not finger swipes, you are wrong. You're wrong. We need to date the right person, which means we got to figure out what right and wrong mean again. Because we think the right person is like, well, you know, this body fat percentage, this height, 
this type of body. You are more than a body. And by the way, it ain't going to be like that forever. And if you make an idol out of a youthful form, then you will spend the rest of your life unhappy. Date the right person or tender is trouble. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life to preserve you from the evil woman from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Now in English, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you read it in Hebrew, there are two different words that show up for evil woman and adulteress. The first word has the connotation of a foreigner or someone not like you. And so I want to talk about this. Don't date the foreigner, and I mean this. I don't mean someone not from the United States. What I mean is someone not from, uh, just calm down, calm down. Oh my gosh, I, it's not a xenophobic weirdo. It's America. We're all foreigners. Come on. Um, what, what I'm talking about is what, what would an Israelite have heard? Well, if you know anything about ancient Israel, you know that God said over, 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 and over, and over, and over, and over again, you do not date people not from your nation. Why? Because the nation was the church. And when God made that nation, he made that nation to be a city on a hill, a light unto the world. They were supposed to be the picture of heaven on earth so that the rest of the nations of the world could go, that's what God is like, and then meet him. And every time they started dating in other nations, intermarriage, what it did is it intermingled souls and the devotion of souls so that now someone who was meant to be worshiping God is worshiping a false god named Molech or Asherah. You see, some of you are Christians and you are dating people who aren't. And the very clear teaching of Scripture, let me, let me say this slowly in bold 26-point font, don't do that. Don't. It's foolish. And listen, I've met the guy who was like, yeah, she dated me to Jesus, and that's awesome. Praise the Lord for that guy. However, I can show you a hundred others that didn't work for, and it ruined many years for many people. Don't do that. If you belong to Jesus, and you're dating with a purpose, then you date people who belong to Jesus. That's what that means. It means don't, don't do that. And when you go, well, but if I don't have Tinder, how am I going to find a really great spouse? And I just want to throw my shoe at you so bad. I won't because I like these shoes. But I don't know. Let me, maybe where would you find a spouse? Well, uh, there are quite a few of you here. There's like a thousand of y'all that call this church your home. I don't know. Maybe you should get on a team or in a group and do something. Meet somebody. I don't know. Maybe instead of sitting in front of your computer making sure the internet works, you might want to develop a social skill and meet somebody. Is he making fun of us? Yes. Yes, he's making fun of you a little bit. He's making fun of you a little bit. Not too much, but just a little. Dating the right person means... Well, the New Testament command is, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Okay, that sounds very ancient. Well, I, you don't, yoke? Do, don't throw eggs at unbelievers? <laughs> well, don't do that, but that's not what the text means. If you, since none of you got here on your ox, I'm assuming you have no idea what this means, so let me explain it to you. Back in the day, agrarian culture, the way you were fruitful is when you tilled up your field so you could plant stuff in it. And the way you tilled it up is when you got your two oxen and you put a yoke over them, which was like a big bar that went over the shoulder of one and the other. You attached a rope to it and they pulled the big heavy piece of metal that plowed up the field, okay? But the, the reason having the oxen equally yoked was important was because if you got a big old ox built big and then an ox built more like me, what happens is they turn in circles and you bear no fruit. Do you get the analogy now? Metaphor becoming clear? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Because God's called you to be fruitful, not just making babies fruitful. I'm talking about a fruit-filled life. Jesus said, it is to my Father's will that you bear much fruit and fruit that remains, which means you've got a patch. You've got some dirt called your destiny, and you've got to till that thing and sow that thing and water it and weed it, and it's going to be real hard to do that if someone that you mingle your soul with has no interest in that. It's, by the way, it's also the trading of generational blessing for immediate satisfaction. Because you're not thinking about your kids and their kids. You're just thinking about you. Don't believe me? Go ahead, go make some kids. My wife and I have eight parents between us. 
with 24 marriages between them. Okay. Date the right person. Date toward marriage. Date the right person. So avoid the strange or foreigner, but also, and again, please don't ever hear me say, not a man, that's not what I mean. I mean, spiritually. And avoid the immoral man or woman. That's the other word. It has to do with their moral character. Some of you, your qualifications for dating them are like, well, what is their body fat percentage? (laughs) But they're morally corrupt. You see? You're, you're dating someone, and maybe they call themselves a Christian, but the things that they're doing, Jesus would go, well, not, not with me, man. Here's a quick test. Is your activity going to remain in the new heavens and the new earth? Like when Jesus comes and evil is gone forever, is your activity going to still be there? Well, then you enjoy the heck out of that. But if it's not, Mm. and certainly don't do that with anybody else. Now, maybe you're thinking like, man, this pastor's being like all fire and brimstone and do this and not that. And Yeah, yeah, I am, because forever is a long time, and you really matter. And if I just told you a gospel, it's just like God is like just a big, fluffy cloud of lovey fluffiness and just you do what you want and just kind of come in here and it's all going to be great. That's a lie. And I could grow a church faster and I could get paid more selling that garbage. It just won't help you. Date toward marriage. Date the right person. Avoid the immoral person. They will lead you away from God and toward hell and death. Remember what what the father figure in the book of Robert says, son, I'm pleading with you. And he uses all of his rhetorical weaponry that he can to describe, like, look, I know the immoral woman looks amazing. And from a distance, she and the woman of wisdom look the same. In fact, she might look a little better. But you get up real close and you find out very quickly that her feet go down to hell. And all who enter through her door never come back. Strong language. Well, as a, as a father in this house, I'm pleading with you. Date the right person. And if you date the right person, eventually you may marry them. So let's talk about that. What does God have to say, what does Proverbs have to say about marriage and the wisdom of marriage? Well, the first thing is receive your spouse as provision from the Lord, or no, the grass is not greener. Receive your spouse as provision from the Lord. This is the person that the Lord God has given to me to help me be what he's asked me to be, not who has given to me for my pleasure. See, if you are dating toward marriage and your your game in dating is like, who makes me feel good? Then what you are, you're not a Christian, you're a vampire. Because what you're looking for is a nice, succulent person to suck out all of their life, throw them away when you're done, and find the next person to make you happy. You're a vortex. But in Christ, that's not what marriage is meant to be at all. It's, who has God called me to walk after him with? See how that works? So as you walk in after Jesus, and then somebody else starts walking after Jesus, and all of a sudden you look over and you go, well, hey. <laughs> and God's kind of, your, your paths merge. That's how that works. All right? And when they do merge, they're merged. In case you're wondering uh, whether you married the right person, if you married them, they're the right person now. So, yes, you did. <laughs> um, and there you are. So, just... Now, let me just, I want to asterisk this. I'm being funny, but um, God takes divorce very seriously and and hates it. There are a few conditions under which we're in when it is permissible, but it is not permissible under most of the ones which we use it for. There's, I I get that there there are cases of abuse, there are cases of violence, there are cases of um, infidelity. We can, we'll talk about that. And if that's you, I just want to, I'm going to pause my own message and say, and you are in a marriage that is in trouble like that, please let us know. Please let us help you. Please let us pray for you. Please let us walk alongside you. Don't feel like you need to be a victim um, or a victimizer on your own. If you need help, we will help you. We would love to help you. Okay? Okay. Back to the message. Receive your spouse's provision from the Lord. House and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent life, wife is from the Lord. Listen, you can make money and build pretty things, but when you marry someone, that is from God to you. That's from God to you. 
But I don't know, I just thought I'd marry someone. I mean, you're 12 years in your marriage, 20 years in your marriage. I just pictured myself with someone a little bit more like what? A little bit more better than you? No. <laughs> no. I just figured it. Mm-mm. No. They're yours. Receive your spouse's provision from the Lord, too. Honor your spouse more than anyone or anything else on earth, including your kids, other than God. Honor your spouse as God's provision. Honor your spouse more than anyone or anything else on earth, including your kids, other than God. We're to honor and to cherish and to love and to bless and to be grateful, especially when you don't want to be... There are times, sometimes, when I am honoring to my wife and loving to her, and I'm not feeling it. That's called self-discipline and self-control. Do that. That's a grace to you. An excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Does she know that about you? Does she know that you trust in her? Does he know that you are just grateful for him? Does he? Does she? Honor them. Third thing, be faithful. (sighs) Be faithful. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. Some of you are reading that and going, well, no problem. It's just porn. Can a man hold fire next to his chest and not be burned? It's just a personal, private, no, it's not, because that's someone's sister, someone's daughter, someone's brother, someone's son that you're looking at. Yeah, it is. And let me tell you, once you get a couple of daughters and sons, and you imagine that being their future, that changes everything. No, faithfulness means no wandering eyes. Now look, I'll I'll tell it to you like a pastor told me once. I can't stop the birds from landing on my head, but I can keep them from building a nest. Make sense? You know what I mean. Sometimes you get some wrong thoughts just flying through your mind, and you're like, what in the world? Good, good, have that reaction, and then go, you know, and throw that thing out and and preach to yourself and, and set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, you'll appear with him and go, you see how I do this? Listen, I travel a lot. Cheating in my life would be easy. Look at pornography, would be easy for me. Do you know how I don't? It is not because I am better than you, that is for sure. It's not because I'm not tempted to. It's because I've set my mind on things above, not on things of the earth. It's because he who's in me is greater than he who's in the world. It's because I have something better than what is on offer here. And I trust God with my desire. I will be faithful to my wife because God has been faithful to me. See how that works? Please hear me. I am not saying that with any pride. I need the grace and mercy of Jesus to keep me faithful to my wife and to you. which we'll get to in a moment. Speak kindly and forgive quickly. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife or husband. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind or grasp oil in one's right hand. Some of you, man, you guys, you're married and you just pick, 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 nag, nag, rude, ugly, pick, 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 like a dripping faucet, like just water torture. And after, you know, a year or two, it's okay. She's fine. It's just a bad habit. And after 12 years, he's like, well, I probably shouldn't murder her. And after 20 years, it gets bad. All right, that's a joke. But you see what I'm saying? Like, you are, just, you, you are being quarrelsome and you're fighting with each other. And that's not just for women. That's for men, too. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God and Christ Jesus has forgiven you. One of my favorite things about my wife that I love, it is a spiritual gift, I am convinced, because I offend her like it is my job. And I can be ugly and my words can hurt her, she forgives me. And then we don't talk about it again. <clears throat> Death and life are in the power of a tongue. A gentle tongue is like a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Yeah, covers them. Doesn't cover them and then uncover them when it's very convenient in an argument. 
Well, let me say about 10 years ago. Ah, floosh, exhibit A, Your Honor. And you just come roll, wheeling out that, that evidence card. Clearly, y'all have never gotten an intense fellowship in a marriage. Um, this was funnier in the first service because everyone was like, yes, yes. Um, can't do that. Can't do that. Speak kindly, forgive quickly. Now, maybe at this point you're like, hey, um, I'm single. I'm not dating anyone. I'm not married to anyone. And this is all very nice to hear about that future moment that may or may not happen, but what should I do now? And I am very glad that you're here. First off, the Proverbs say to you this, stop waiting to live and work your land. Church, I love you. I do. And one of the weird things, Pastor Donnie and I talk about this sometimes, one of the weird things that happens as a pastor is like you start to just flat care about people and it is so inconvenient. Um, so if you're like me, you are not wired to do that. Um, I, I, I am wired to be task oriented and not care about you. And then God starts, man, just making me love you. And I'm like, uh, it's like that moment at the end of the Grinch, you know, when his heart swelled and you're like, ah, oh, what is this new feeling of feelings? Uh, uh. It's very inconvenient. It's very good. And, um, and I love you. And one of the things that I hate to see amongst you who are single is this feeling like you are in purgatory, like you're in the waiting room of life. Like, just, I guess I'll just sit here and read magazine until, like, you know, my knight in shining armor, that beautiful woman or whatever, comes along. And that's just not the way it's meant to be. Listen to what the scriptures say. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. And you're like, how's that about singleness? I tell you, because you've been given land. It's called your life. You've been given a patch of dirt. You've been given something over which you are responsible to weed, to till, to water, and to make bear fruit. And that does not happen merely when you say, I do. That happens immediately upon self-realization that you belong to Christ. And now you've got something that you are going to hold before him and say, this is what I did with it. And he's going to either say, well done, good and faithful servant, or why did you wait 30 years to get started? Singleness is a time for you to get to work. It's a time for you to get to work on your character, to get to work on your career, to get to work on, on your hopes and your dreams and the things that God has put in your heart to do, the good things, the good things, the things that God has put there, not the things the world says you need. Okay, maybe, maybe eight hours a day at the gym is a little too much. Okay, maybe you don't need a longer selfie stick to get to stop it. All right, that's not what I'm talking about. If you have a selfie stick, I would like for you to hit it over your head until it breaks and, and then don't buy another one. Um, is he kidding? No, he's not kidding at all. Um, I hate those things. Um, everybody looks good with a sepia filter on Instagram, okay? Everybody. Um, I'm so authentic. Uh, <laughs> all right. Stop waiting to live and work your land. Two, pursue contentment in God. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. And this is the promise. Surely there is a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Surely there is a future. Now, that's not a promise for a spouse. I don't know your future, but there is one. And may I just submit this to you for your consideration, that if it is really true that you and I, by faith in Jesus, now have God living on the inside of us, that he is better than a spouse. Could it be possible that Jesus is cooler than a dude or a gal? Just pray about that. Stop waiting to live. Pursue contentment. Three, receive your, receive your season as a gift. And this is really big. So once upon a time, when I was in seminary, um, I was writing a paper on this Greek word, Charis, it's the word for gift. And I was thinking I was going to write a paper on spiritual gifts because that's how the word is used most often in the New Testament. But I found this word lodged in a place in the New Testament that I did not know it lived. And it's right here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And this is what Paul says, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind, one of another. To the unmarried and widows I say, and then he gives them some instructions. And to the married I give this charge and gives them some instructions. Only let each person lead the life that God has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Do you realize that here, God, in his word, is saying that singleness is a gift and that marriage is a gift? 
Well, if you don't realize it, let me, let me just make the case a little bit further for you. That word, charis, it only shows up in gifts like those two gifts and then spiritual gifts and then that's it. And every time the word shows up, and this was the point of the paper I was writing, those gifts are given for mission, for purpose, for destiny, for getting God's glory shown in the world, for telling people about Jesus, for growing something, not just for my own happy little pleasure, right? Spiritual gifts are not like Oprah's favorite things, okay? They're not just like, see, apparently none of you know what that is, and now I feel a little embarrassed that I do. Um, they're, they're not just like things that you get, and you're like, ooh, this is nice. No, they're not, they're not just for that. They're for your joy in using them for God, which means your single season is a gift from God to you. Use it. How dare God put a gift in your hand and you go, I don't like it. Or you do what kids do, and they're like, but I wanted that. Ugh. Or the grown-up version, I'm going to tweet about it. Right? I'm gonna have a, or you couch your whining in prayer requests that people don't need to pray for. Could you pray for me? I'm just feeling uh, disobedient. <laughs> yeah, I'll pray for you, but how about this? Don't do that. <laughs> um, receive your season as a gift. I'm being serious. Because your season, whether it's for your whole life or whether it's for a moment, is eschatological. Let me explain what I mean. Your, your season has, has a point. I mean, some of you literally think that, like, single, well, nothing good can happen in single. It's not like any important people ever did anything great when they were single, except Jesus and, and Paul. Eh, but other than that, um, and, like, and like millions of other people, um, you know, it's not, like, it's not like God saved humanity through a single man, which is a miracle all by itself, if you know any single men. Um, <laughs> burn, yeah. <laughs> And it's not like, what, 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 anybody else do anything sing, single, greatest missionary ever, planted all the churches, wrote the Bible. But you're right, God probably can't use your single season. Come on. Have some faith. Trust him. Trust him. Hasn't he proven himself trustworthy? Hasn't he, while you were yet a sinner, sent Jesus to die for you? Hasn't he poured out the Holy Spirit? Hasn't he given you oxygen? And you didn't even ask for it this morning. How nice. Your heart is still beating, cell division is still occurring, right? You're not falling out of existence for some reason. Gravity works, no one really knows why. That was awfully nice of him. I wonder if you can trust him. I think so. I think so. But I mentioned that, that these seasons, they're eschatological. What I mean by that is in the end, in the new heavens and new earth, they're both going away because something better is showing up. Singleness is a season designed to inflame longing, which will be satisfied in Christ. Did you know that? Singleness is a season designed to make you long for something that only Jesus can fulfill. And marriage, marriage is a poor, paltry imitation of the thing that Christ will give in the new heavens and the new earth. That is why Jesus said marriage is going away. In the new heavens and new earth, they will neither be married nor given in marriage. That, he said that. Now, I have some questions about that, but at least what that means is the nature of the thing to be revealed when Christ returns is of such a kind that it's better than sex, it's better than singleness, and it's better than marriage. It's going to be so great that those things just fall out. They're going to be like Windows 95, man. They're just gone, all right? Nobody's using it anymore because there's something better now given that makes them obsolete. What will that be like? I don't know, but that sounds kind of great. And if you will trust him, then you will see that your season of either being married or season of waiting for that moment or season of never having it is not dehumanizing to you, but actually inflaming in you a longing that you were designed to have that will only be satisfied in Christ. And if you try to pursue relationships without that hope, then you will put too much weight on them. If you get married to someone and you invest in them all of your hope for happiness, you will break them because they are not designed to haul that load. They're not. And if you were like, hey, I marry you because you make me happy. Oh, great. <laughs> well, as long as I do that all the time, then we're going to be perfect. But I don't know if you've met any other humans, but that does not how they work. And singleness is the same thing. If you just spend the whole time you're just waiting on something... That, Wait on Jesus and be found working until you do. You see, only Jesus 
takes the pressure off romantic relationships enough so that they can actually work. And then, when you fail at doing them, when you sin against your spouse, when you mess up in your dating, or when you mess up in singleness, he waits there with grace to forgive you and restore you. See how great Jesus is? Only Jesus takes the, takes the pressure off relationships enough so that they can actually work, so I'm not investing Messiah-like hopes in my wife, and when I mess up my relationship, when I speak unkindly, when I'm rude, when I'm impatient, he awaits to forgive me. When you mess up and you go too far with someone that you're dating, when you refuse to trust Christ and you become addicted to pornography, when you seek to satisfy longings in your body that weren't made to be satisfied that way, and you cease trusting Jesus, and you begin trusting that, yeah, I'm going to take care of this myself. Not only does he say, give you the power to obey, but the grace to forgive you when you do. But that's probably not relevant to anyone. Wherever you are in your relationship journey, single, dating, or married, the great thing is you can come to Jesus. This is not just a how-to sermon. Because those send people to hell forever. This is a sermon about Jesus and how he can give you hope in all of life's seasons.